All right, in topic 3B.2, we begin the string of several topics in a row where we start talking about the key features of graphs and how they're defined by either the first or second derivatives. So really this topic is all about defining some important things that we're gonna work with. Uh, you can see we've got our last value theorem here, the extreme value theorem, which we'll talk about here in a second. The idea of global or local extrema, and then also, uh, as the name implies, the very important idea of critical points. So first we need to understand the definition when we see the word extrema. When we talk about extrema, it refers to either the minimum or maximum values that a function takes on over an interval. We say that it has either a global or absolute extrema at x equals c. Uh, if f of c is less than equal uh, to f of x for all x in the domain of f, which would be a global minimum, or if it's greater than f of x for all x, then it's a global maximum. Basically, a global or absolute maximum is the absolute highest value that it takes, whereas a minimum would be the absolute lowest. We also have the idea of local or relative extrema. If it's uh, f of d is less than or equal to f of x or greater than or equal to f of x for all x in an interval containing d. And you can kind of see here, we've got a graph of f of x. You're gonna see each of these kind of laid out here. So if we look at point A, point A is going to be a minimum value. You can see it is less than some of the other values around it. It's not the absolute minimum. In fact, we can go ahead and label the absolute or the global minimum as occurring at point C. Likewise, the global maximum occurs up here at point D. So this would be the global minimum and the global maximum. However, you can look at C, point A and point B, we can still describe, let's do B first. You can see here that it's a maximum in a certain area containing B. That's what we mean by local maximum at point B. And point A is the lowest point within a certain interval. It's not the lowest point overall, but it is a local uh, minimum value for f of x. So this gives you a visual idea of what we're referring to when we talk about either local or global minimum or maximum values, but they all kind of fall under the umbrella of what we call extrema. So our last value theorem of calculus is called the extreme value theorem. It's a very simple one to work with. It says that if a function f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, then the extreme value theorem guarantees that f has at least one minimum value and at least one maximum value on the interval a to b. So if it's continuous on an interval, it has to have a low point, it has to have a high point. So let's take a look at some functions. We're gonna determine if the following functions are guaranteed to have an absolute maximum, uh, which would be guaranteed by the EVT on the interval negative two to two. So f of x equals x times sine of x. There's no value I can't plug in for x here, no value I can't plug in for sine of x f of x is continuous on the closed interval negative 2 to 2, so the EVT does apply. And if we were to graph that on that interval, it would have somewhere an absolute maximum value. All right, let's take a look at the next function. We have x plus 1 over x squared minus 1. As you figure, we can factor out this denominator as x plus 1 times x minus 1. Uh, the x plus 1's cancel, however, it's not continuous at negative 1. It's also not continuous at positive 1, both of which are on this interval. Uh, f of x is not continuous on the interval negative 2 to 2. So the EVT in this case does not apply. So it's not guaranteed to have an absolute maximum. In fact, if we were to graph it, we would probably see some asymptote behavior uh, around probably positive one, uh, and that would give us a scenario where we did not have an absolute maximum. Now then the absolute value of x minus one, we looked at in the previous topic with the mean value theorem. It's not differentiable at x equals one where you have that sharp corner, but it is continuous at x equals one. And so it's continuous, on that closed interval negative two to two. So we can say in this case that the extreme value theorem does apply. So again, all it has to have here for the extreme value theorem to guarantee the existence of either a minimum or maximum value is that the function is continuous on the closed interval. So one of the next things we're gonna look at here in this class is 
how do we actually find where these extrema occur? And this is going to be our first reliance on the idea of critical points. As the name implies, it's going to be a really important idea for us here in calculus. Uh, it's going to be important in finding a lot of different key features. Uh, but we say that a function f has a critical point at x equals c if one of the following are true. Either f prime of c is equal to 0. So it's a critical point if it's a value where its derivative is equal to 0 or if f prime of c is undefined. Uh, provided that f of c is defined. And this is a situation where maybe the function's defined at a value, but the derivative doesn't exist, and you may already see a couple of these uh, occurring right here. So just kind of an idea, too, of what this looks like when the derivative is equal to 0. It's going to be a moment where uh, the function kind of stops right here, the horizontal tangent line, or sorry, the tangent line is literally horizontal at a given point. And you can kind of see here, since we're talking about extrema, how maybe that is going to be a really important moment. So in both of these cases, the tangent line is horizontal, uh, and so f prime of c would be equal to zero. So let's look at it graphically here and determine the critical points of the following function. Well, the first one that we see here is at x equals 0. Uh, f prime of 0 is undefined because of a cusp, but f of 0 does exist. So at x equals 0, uh, where there is a cusp, we have a critical point. And then we would make our way. This is still kind of curved. And so at x equals 1, uh, we have another cusp. Coming down here, we also have a cusp at x equals 2. So we have three cusps. Now then, at x equals 3, we don't have a cusp. This is a very smooth uh, curve right here. But x equals 3 is still a critical point, And that's because f prime of 3 is equal to 0. The tangent line would be horizontal. And if you look at those values, 0, 1, 2, and 3, you can see the presence of extrema, of either minimum or maximum values, just kind of looking at it on the graph. So one of the things you're going to have to do here early on is determine the critical points of functions. And basically the idea is we're going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero and then solve. And that's going to tell us the critical points. We'll also get situations where maybe the derivative is undefined. Uh, and so we'll look at points, uh, critical points in that behavior. So we have f of x equals the sine of x. We want f prime of x, which of course is the cosine of x. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the cosine of x and set it equal to 0. On the interval 0 to 2 pi, cosine is 0 at x equals pi over 2 and at x equals 3 pi over 2. And those would be the critical points of sine of x. And if you were to graph sine of x, you would notice something important happening at those particular values. All right, f of x equals x cubed minus 2x squared. Let's go ahead and find f prime of x. It's 3x squared minus 4x. We want to go ahead and set it equal to 0. And we can notice that we can factor out an x. So we have x times 3x minus 4 set equal to 0. And that means that we have critical points at either x equals 0 or at x equals 4 thirds. And again, we'll be doing a lot of stuff with these critical points here in the near future. Uh, but this is how we find them. All right, f of x equals the cube root of x squared. And you may remember from taking derivatives that we want to be able to express this as x to a power and it's x to the two thirds. So when I take the derivative, f prime of x is two thirds x to the minus one third. And so f prime of x is two over the cube root of x, two over three. Uh, cube root of x. Well, this actually never equals 0 because the numerator 2 never equals 0. So f prime of x never equals 0. So we're not going to get a critical point there. However, f prime of 0, if I put a 0 in for this x here, it's undefined. So f prime of 0 is undefined. And this is going to be a critical point as long as f of 0 is equal to something. And if I plug 0 in and square it, I get 0. The cube root of 0 is also 0. 
So even though f prime of zero is undefined, we know that f of zero is equal to zero. So that's going to mean that there is a critical point at x equals zero. And if you actually graph it, you see an idea of a vertical tangent line, uh, which is why this particular situation, uh, sorry, f prime of zero being undefined uh, happens there. So we do have a critical point at x equals zero because it's in the domain of f. Now that let's take a look at f of x. You may notice already I have an x cubed. That means that zero is not in the domain of f. So even if I take the derivative here, uh, I would end up in a situation where um, zero is not going to be a critical point because it's not even a point of f of x. Okay, I wanna take the derivative of this. So let's go ahead and I see uh, a single term in the denominator. So let's go ahead and split it up. We have three. X squared over X cubed is going to be X to the minus one. And it's gonna be minus three X to the minus three. And that's gonna be a really easy derivative. You also could accomplish this to using the quotient rule here, but I have F prime of X is equal to negative three X to the minus two plus nine X to the minus four. Now then, this is one of those situations where all of a sudden, the way we simplify our derivative is gonna matter because we wanna be able to set it equal to zero. So let's go ahead and rewrite it without negative exponents. So this is gonna be negative three over x squared plus nine over x to the fourth. Now we wanna be able to set this equal to zero. So what I really wanna do is to get a common denominator here. I already have nine over x to the fourth. So I've got three over x squared. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this by x squared over x squared. And what I get is negative three x squared plus nine over x to the fourth. That's what f prime of x is equal to. So the algebra trick here was multiplying this by x squared over x squared to give me a common denominator of x to the fourth. Okay, so I've got x to the fourth, which will never, uh, which sorry, f prime of zero is going to be undefined. But remember, we already made the disclaimer that f of zero is not in the domain of f, so we don't have a critical point at zero. We do, however, have a critical point wherever negative uh, 3x squared plus 9 is equal to 0, wherever the numerator is equal to 0. So we can add 3x squared to both sides and get 9 equals 3x squared. That means that x squared is equal to 3. And so we do have critical points at x equals plus or minus the square root of 3, making sure we do get a plus or minus when we take an even root like that. But again, 0 not in the domain of f, so it's not going to be a critical point, even though the derivative is undefined at zero. So again, your critical points occur whenever the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative is undefined, provided that the function actually exists at that particular value.